when I got through, I kind of sat down and said, okay, I haven't had a chance to focus on this, but it's kind of been building up inside of me as I've stored a little stuff away and, you know, st stuck copies of files and folders and things and said, you know, I want to go back and think about this from a law standpoint. And so I went back through and thought about it and thought about how we could start to change the practice and change the lives of lawyers and change how we perform for society by doing that. And uh, um, had, had started, had written some things up on that and started working on it. Got asked to speak at some CLE programs uh, around here and then got asked to come back and to do more and uh, found out I really liked doing that kind of thing. And, it, and so had spent the last really three years kind of working through how all the findings in positive psychology relate to kind of the unique aspects of practicing law. Why is it that law school is so damaging to students, which, which we know it is? Uh, why is it that lawyers are the way they are when they're out in practice? Why is it that law firms are the way they are? And a lot of it starts to make sense when you understand some of the psychology components behind it and some of the issues that, that affect lawyers, because our, our practice aren't, isn't like other folks. And you know, some of the differences are we deal with more zero-sum situations uh, than almost any other profession. So we deal with more situations where it's for me to win, somebody else has to lose. For me to have more, somebody else has to lose, have less, or for my clients to do that. Uh, and we do that partially because if there was a win-win solution, something where we could both have more, um, it would have been reached before it came to the lawyer's office. So law exists to resolve disputes short of blood feuds or something along those lines. And so we get the knotty problems. We get the ones where there's not an obvious solution that works for everybody. If there was, like I said, it wouldn't, wouldn't be there. And zero-sum situations are conflict. They uh, engender negative emotions. Negative emotions tend to make us narrow our focus, disconnect from other people. Uh, we, we're not at our best. We're not, we don't think as broadly. We don't collaborate as well. We're not as creative when we're in a negative emotional mood. But, you know, I mean, think about litigation, you know, uh, anger, uh, a certain sense of self-righteousness, kind of a combative thing, can fuel our behavior, can help us get through that very difficult kind of process. But it also tends to make us Rambo litigators. It tends to create uh, more cost and expense in litigation uh, than it should. And we all know people who, you know, when I started practice, they were known as the grand old men of the law because they just about all were at that time. They were in the, at the end of their careers when I started. And they were all just wonderful human beings, complete gentlemen, but they, would, they were outstanding advocates. It wasn't that their clients got shortchanged in the deal, it's just they didn't make everybody mad. And sometimes that resulted in a better resolution than would have been possible otherwise. And as I started to look at this, I started, well, you know, that makes sense. We understand that. But why is it that so many of us have trouble being that way? So we've got the zero-sum situation, but we've also got the, the problem that um, we deal with values conflicts. So the other aspect of the kind of cases that we get is that many times there are key values that our society and, in fact, that human beings around the world have endorsed. There's a core set of values that are common uh, across cultures and apparently across time uh, that, that underlie much of what we care about and do in society. They end up on opposite sides of cases. I mean, you can take almost any Supreme Court case, and you're going to end up with values on the other side. So think about, for example, the Miranda case. You know, you've got the values on one side, of uh, protecting rights of individual, protecting its government overreaching, but on the other side, you've got protecting society. These are values we all care about. There's not a, a good and bad here. There's two goods that are in conflict. Uh, if you're working in family law cases, you've got uh, rights for the parent in terms of staying involved in the lives of their children, rights for the children involved. Then you've got rights of, of the other parent in terms of being able to pursue a career, being able to, to earn money for the family that get into conflict, you end up with situations where folks can't move from certain areas, those kind of things. It's not that there's a right and wrong there. We're dealing with values that are good on both sides. And so what has happened, and this is where I'll be interested to, to hear what Dean Rubin says about that. Uh, if you think about it, that's been the case for the hundreds of years that American law has been, uh, in, English and American law have, have been developing, and really legal systems everywhere. Those have been fundamental kinds of dynamics. And um, if you're dealing with situations where your emotions are being pulled negatively on a regular basis and you don't have any other way to deal with it, mindfulness, 
for example, being one uh, alternative approach. Your tendency is going to be to sort of disconnect from emotions. So you get this rationalistic kind of, um, you know, we just need to keep emotions out of this. You'll hear lawyers say that to clients sometimes. Well, you can't keep emotions out of stuff. That part of our brain that deals with emotions also is one of the key parts of our intelligence. So if you're talking about coming up with resolutions, and I'm not talking about just creative, I'm talking about analytical intelligence here. It's not like the, there's an emotional part and a rational part. They're all mixed together. And the part that deals with emotions is heavily important to how we think. So when we cut that off, we're actually limiting our ability to think in our best sort of way. But if you're dealing with situations where these heavy emotions are coming, that's going to be one tendency. If you're dealing with a situation where values are in conflict, there's going to be a tendency to say, you know, I've got to kind of disconnect from these values. And in fact, that's what Larry Krieger has found in his research actually happens in law school, is that students tend to move from intrinsic values, those that they own, to extrinsic, kind of what can I get out of this, sorts of things. And we see that in other data. So for example, if you look at, the, um, I mentioned the Authentic Happiness website, one of the instruments they have there is a character strength survey, the values and, values and action inventory of strengths, that looks at 24 character strengths that have been recognized and endorsed in uh, cultures and philosophies and religions around the world for all of recorded history. Uh, so these are kind of core human qualities. Well, if you pull lawyers out of that data set and look at them, we endorse 21 of those 24 strengths at rates significantly lower than the average po population. So we have to, and the ones that we don't are curiosity, love of learning, and I won't say creativity off the top of my head, but they're three intellectual kinds of traits. They're not the emotional, they're not the social kinds of uh, the traits that are in there. We have ha we've had to disconnect, and I don't think that's, you know, all the data, if looking, talking to Larry uh, Craig or Susan Dykoff, all the data we've got about lawyers suggests that coming into law school, coming out of college into law school, we're so much like everybody else that it's, there may be some slight differences. Susan says there's a little tendency to not to be as emotionally inclined to listen to emotional data as others, but it, it's, it's small. It's not, it's not anything that accounts for the huge differences, for example, seeing depression rates that run two to four times the national average. There's nothing in, in the kind of self-selection factor that would account for that. So it's other things that are going on. So you've got this negative emotional things, you've got the values, and we see it in Larry's data, but we also see it in Elizabeth Mertz's work that she did in law schools, looking at the language that's used in law school and how we teach. And what she found was that looking at um, top level tier one national law schools, all the way down to very local tier, tier four law schools, looking at teachers who range from old white males to young black females, looking at teaching styles that range from uh, semi-Socratic, uh, maybe not pure Socratic, but semi-Socratic, to almost pure lecture. Same thing was going on in every classroom in terms of values. It was an unconscious thing with the teachers, not in any case, the it's culture. It's how we've learned to talk about stuff. And it was to disconnect from values, to devalue values as a basis of resolving disputes. I was talking with, um, with somebody the other day about this and he came up and he said, oh yeah, yeah, he said, I remember the day in law school, I'm, you know, after a few months I kind of got sort of tired of this and I started to argue that there was kind of a right and wrong and it was values and he said it was it was the other class members who hooted me down you know well that exact that exact same exchange is in Elizabeth Burt's book she pulls it out as an example and part of it is that you really it does become hard to use values because they're on both sides but we don't talk about it that way and we don't talk about the reason why those values are important to society and to us we just talk about they don't help us resolve disputes. And so we become hyper-focused on that kind of area. So you've got the zero-sum thing, you've got the values kind of thing going on, and from those, you get cultural aspects among lawyers. So we develop ways of talking with each other, our adversarial skills stay in play at times when we ought to pull them out. So you just get this kind of thing, this self-feeding thing that creates unhappiness, that creates distress, that creates depression. Uh, that creates uh, anxiety, substance abuse, all the things we deal with in our disciplinary agencies and our lawyers' assistance programs. But many of them were exacerbating by how we start lawyers in the practice and then how we work together with one another when we get there. 